Thanks very much, everybody. Um, my name is Megan Berry. I work as community development worker in Pavy Point, um, and I also work in the new University um, Access Programme as the Traveller Outreach Officer, supporting travellers um, to navigate to third level systems. And um, yeah, so I suppose you're all welcome to our information session this morning, where we're going to look at um, travellers and access to higher education. So I can see, um, and thanks, Laura, for putting us on the big screen, I can see so many people from, you know, HSE, uh, various access offices, PAD coordinators here, um, mental health coordinators, some of the TU um, staff and National Traveller MABS and colleagues on the STAR project and HEI. So you're all very welcome. Um, so as always, it's, it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speakers today. <laughs> um, so firstly, we'll start with Anastasia Quickly, which is the chairperson of Pavy Point Traveller Roma Centre. Um, she's also the chairperson of the UN Committee of Elimination of Racial Discrimination from 2016 to 2018 and an elected member from 2010. She was the first chair of the EU Fundamental Rights Agency, a member of the Advisory Committee of the Council of Europe Framework Convention and um, <coughs> the personal representative of the OCSE Chair in Office of Racism. Anastasia was a former senior lecturer in Minu University, and until 2015, she was head of the Department of Applied Social Studies. Anastasia is a founder of... That's enough, that's enough, that's enough about me, they'll be sick of me. Are you sure? <laughs> Absolutely sure. <laughs> and then we'll move on then to our second speaker, which is Dr Rose Ryan. Uh, Dr. Rose is the Director of Access in Minute University, and she has the responsibility then for leading strategic change in relation to access and widening participation in higher education. Dr. Ryan leads on the Minute University Access Programme, which works in partnership across the university and alongside underrepresented learners, schools and communities to increase equity of access and support student success. Dr. Ryan is currently leading on a number of strategic initiatives with a range of partners across the university and externally aimed at addressing systemic level objectives, including the Turn to Teaching, which is the largest national initiative to diversify and access to initial teacher education, and also then the College Connect, which is a partnership with Dublin um, City University, Dundalk Institute of Technology and the Technological University of Shannon. Um, Dr. Ryan is also a lead on the development of the National Student and Research Help Desk, which provided a single point for application <laughs> from students displaced from Ukraine in Ireland um, seeking to, to access higher education here. So we're looking forward to hearing from the two of you in just a minute, but firstly, I might just run through the agenda for this morning. So we will begin by hearing from Anastasia and she'll talk about the National Access Plan for Equity of Access, Participation, Success in Higher Education. And then we might just hand the floor over to Dr. Rose, who will deliver a presentation then on Traveller and Roma specific supports. Um, and then I might speak to my own experience of uh, being a traveller in education and then, you know, looking at, at the experiences of, I have identified throughout my work in Pavy Point and also in my new access programme. What we will ask people to do then is to go into breakout rooms and have a bit of a discussion on maybe some of the things that came up throughout um, some of the speakers or things that you want to comment on. And um, yeah, so that's that for that section. And then we might just just let everyone know, as Laura said earlier, this session will be recorded. If you can mute yourself, please. Um, if you're not talking, that would be great help. And just to say as well, there is a chat box below if anybody have any questions throughout the session or if you want to raise your hand, we're very much happy to take um, them questions. So I suppose without further ado, I might hand over to Anastasia. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and welcome again to everybody. A particular welcome maybe, and I can't see the screen, so it's no harm. Like, so I can't say who I'm talking to. But uh, I'm, I, a particular welcome to people who have come from traveller organisations, because in, in this sort of work in Pavy Point, we've always made, uh, we, we've, we've always put a very big emphasis on, on supporting traveller organisations on one hand, but also on our work and what we do, being informed by what you say and what you think needs to, what you think needs to happen. Um, this then today is part of our ongoing process, part of the ongoing processes that the education programme has engaged in. And you, you will recall that during COVID, 
there were a couple of education forums that we ran in conjunction with the National Traveller Women's Forum, which looked at education issues. In fact, the first one of them looked very explicitly at issues for travellers in higher education and further education and outwards from that then to other areas. And out of that, and the reason I'm saying all of this is that out of that, we made a number of submissions to the action plan that I'm going to talk about. Uh, in the end, we tried to get them to move the uh, the targets they were setting for travellers up considerably, but we, we, we haven't done too badly, I feel, overall. So I would like to acknowledge you know, in, in the, the contributions that a number of your organisations have made to this um, equity of action plan, uh, contributions that we attempted to put together and to make to the HEA and the Department of Further and Higher Education. Um, so I would also like to explain that this is the fourth national action plan for equity of access. The third national action plan did name travellers. That didn't happen by accident, as you might have thought. Uh, Pabby Point campaigned for travellers to be named in, named in the third equity of action plan. And then uh, midway through, when that wasn't really achieving a huge amount, Pavi Point, with support from other traveller organisations, campaigned for an action plan for travellers, a specific action plan for travellers. And the Minister of State responsible for higher education of the day, in fact, it was Mary Mitchell O'Connor, agreed to that. Uh, so we had a specific action plan then for participation of travellers in higher education that came from that. Uh, uh, the, we, we felt very strongly and we feel, still feel very strongly that the naming of travellers is really important. And we felt very strongly for this plan that the naming of travellers and Roma was very important. It's a bit like if you don't name us as women, then we don't exist and the whole universe gets to be populated by men. And if we don't name minorities, not so as to blame people, but so as to make sure that people get their rights. So, and as you know as well, Pavi Point in that regard has a long standing commitment to disaggregated data. In fact, as we speak, Lindsay, another colleague is attempting to influence the European Union on the disaggregation of data and on how it ought to be done in Ireland, so as to support people. So we pushed really hard for targets for travellers in education. The Minister for Higher Education has set a target now for travellers again in the fourth action plan. Um, but, and the, the Minister for uh, DCE DIY for Equality and Children is setting, is setting some targets for early years. But unfortunately in the education field, we remain in a situation where there are no targets set for first or second level. And in particular, if you're looking at third level education, there are no targets set for the transition of travelers. So very briefly then, what I'm supposed to be talking to you about is this. The National Access, Access Plan, and maybe we can go back to the slides then, Laura, which is a strategic action plan for equity of access and success in higher education. Personally, I prefer to call it outcomes because by outcomes, what we mean is, it's not enough that travelers and Roma get into higher education. It's not enough that travelers and Roma participate in higher education, that they get degrees, postgraduates, whatever they get. It's also important that people get jobs and that there are outcomes that go beyond the sort of um, scripts and the degrees that they are awarded, because there's not much point in people going through unless there are specific outcomes. And this is the sort of connectedness that we're attempting to make in our work and in this project. So um, we now there, the fourth National Action Plan is ambitious, I'd have to say. The National Access Plan is ambitious. I'm, I'm getting confused between things like the National Action Plan on Racism, which is also ambitious and hopefully will appear soon, and the National Action Plan for Higher Education. So what they're saying is that the student body should reflect the diversity and social mix of Ireland, and that it should also reflect inclusive higher education institutions, which support and foster student success for all. Uh, as we all know, there's a bit of a road to go to achieve those ambitions, but at least they have been named. 
Um, and then moving quickly on, there are three priority groups that are given, that are named explicitly in the plan. First of all, socioeconomic disadvantaged. And there's a number of subgroups named there. That doesn't mean there aren't uh, others that I haven't listed. For example, for the first time, people leaving care and care, people leaving care are named. Um, single parents are named. Domestic violence survivors are named. People with experience our criminal justice system experiences are named and once again mature students are named and some of us feel that it's really important that mature students are named because certainly in my experience in Maynooth mature students from marginalized and disadvantaged background and mature traveler students have all gone on to make very big contributions in their own communities. They've come from work in their own communities and they're going back then, they go back then to work in their own communities. So really important and maybe an underestimated category in the, the, the plans to date and particularly an, underest an underestimated focus uh, on mature students that come from traveler and Roma backgrounds. Traveler and Roma are named as a particular target. And that's because the figures I'm going to show you in a minute demonstrate that travelers explicitly need to be named as a particular target in order to ensure improved participation by travelers in higher education. They haven't set targets for Roma. That's because the data, to be quite honest, isn't available. Uh, the data that the HEA collected last year indicated that 95 Roma started as first year students. But to be perfectly honest with you, and I have discussed this with them, I think there was a degree of confusion between Roma and Romanians in that figure. So I'm not I'm not sure whether that figure is accurate or not. So we're we're awaiting better data to see how what targets they will be able to set for Roma participation. But travelers and Roma are particularly named and people with disabilities are named as well. And in, in that focus on people with disabilities on this occasion, there's a particular focus on people who could be experiencing mental health issues. And I think those are, it, it, it's, it's quite important that those are in, included there, as well as a focus on autism, as well as a focus on uh, people who, um, who have special needs. Now, so those are the priority groups. It also includes committed to disaggregated data and ethnic equality monitoring. To be fair, the Higher Education Authority have started this, but they need to do it a little bit better. They need to ask everyone the same question. Um, it's, it's committed to cohesion with NITRAS, the National Traveller Roma Inclusion Strategy and the National Action Plan Against Racism. As you know, we're awaiting the next iteration of the National Traveller Roma Inclusion Strategy. It's over a year overdue. And of course, one of the commitments in the National Traveller Roma Inclusion Strategy was that strategy for traveller education, which still remains unfulfilled. It, 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 it acknowledges that there are legacies of COVID. And for example, that those legacies of COVID are very visible in traveller participation in third level. For, in 2021, 33 traveller students started in third level. And in the previous year, 19, 20, 48 traveller students started in third level. So already, I mean, we can't say for sure, but already you can see the difference between the years when there was COVID and there wasn't COVID. It's committed to diversity as a performance indicator. And I hope that means that the higher education institutions will be judged on how, uh, how they perform in meeting the targets for travelers and others. There are 50 additional bursaries of 5,000 each in the 1916 bursaries, uh, bursaries and Rose will be talking about those. So I'm not going to go into it here. And then there's also, and Rose will be talking about this too, so I won't go into it. A new, what they call path five, and Rose will explain to you what these paths are, the, the different funding streams in the action plan. Uh, a three-year pilot at 450,000 per year, which builds on that dormant accounts initiative that a number of us pushed, a number of ourselves, Pavi Point and other traveller organisations pushed to get uh, uh, given to travellers and to support traveller access. It's for direct travellers, it's for uh, supporting access in the institutions and for broader community initiatives. 
relatives as well. So those are the commitments. Moving quickly on, travellers in, uh, I, I can't see the figures actually, travellers in education in 2020, what I think I know them off the top of my head, there, there were 118 travellers in higher education in 2021. And, but the new traveller students enrolling, 33 is the figure they have in the plan. Actually, the HEA figure was 39. So I don't know how, how six, maybe six dropped out, but that's that's the that's the figure that's in the plan. The the um the the target for new traveler students per year by the end of the plan is 150 new traveler students per year. We've pushed and successfully because it's now agreed for that to be reviewed by the midterm. Uh, I'd I'd like to feel that if um if the unit if if all if all of us were able to do our work that that could be achieved a good deal quicker. The previous target was. 80 new traveller students per year. So uh, it is almost a doubling of the previous target. And then the previous midterm review led to that action plan I spoke of earlier. OK, and I think I, there's just a few final comments I'd like to make. I think for all of this work and for all of the things that we're involved in and for the things that our Rose is involved in too, um, sometimes equality is seen as an also ran. And I'd like to say that equality is an asset in the pursuit of excellence. You can't have excellence unless you have equality. But what we're trying to do here is create expectations. And we're in, in effect, we're talking about what has taken 150 years for the non-traveller population to get to it with regard to education, particularly at third level. And we're trying to support or encourage travellers to get there very, very quick or so quickly. So we're at the foothills of a new climb with what I would call a COVID background and faced by a number of challenges that are on the very last slide, I think, uh, faced by a number of challenges including, well, we don't need those because I think Rose is going to talk about those. So we we'll go straight ahead to the next one, Laura. In, in, including um, racism and including uh, institutions whose cultures need to be changed. So um, traveller access, participation and outcomes are really important. Mature travellers ca can be role models. We need disaggregated data, which is limited. Uh, travellers have plenty of interest in education, but there aren't enough focused curriculum and culture initi initiatives. And the net effect of all of this for the whole of society is that society uh, is deprived of some, not all, but some of the contributions that travellers and Roma can make in society. So it's a responsibility of all of us to make sure that that doesn't continue. Thanks very much. Brilliant. Thanks very much for that, Anastasia. Um, we might move on to Rose. Okay, thanks very much, Megan. <clears throat> Are you okay for me to go ahead? Yep. Yeah, perfect. So uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for, for uh, joining. And thank you so much, um, Anastasia. I'm always reminded when you speak, uh, everything that you say resonates, I think, with my own experience and my own uh, work, but you, you put it in a really nice way. And I love the way that you've you've described their kind of the national policy perspective. And I'm going to give you, I hope, some advice and some clarity in relation to the HEI or the higher education perspective. And even though my role is the Director of Access in Maynooth University, I'm trying to represent the full sector. Um, so I'll speak a little bit about the Maynooth piece, but I'll also be referring the work that's happening in other um, institutions. I think the great advantage of the way that this um, information session is positioned is that Stacia has really nicely, I think, collated almost the historical context. And I love the way you describe at the foothills of a new climb. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that. Um, from a HEI perspective, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about um, all of the various supports that are in, in place. And I, then, I think Megan is going to speak about a personal perspective, but I think I'm going to relate to all three also, because I think I have a little bit of a, a personal perspective also to um, show with you. So I'm just going to share my screen, if that's OK. And hopefully this will work for you. Is that OK? Perfect. Okay, 
So I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, Stacia just mentioned there about culture. So I want to talk a little bit actually more about uh, culture. And I really agree with the, the point that you made about society being deprived of traveler and Roma contributions, but the higher education sector has been very much deprived of them also. And I want to talk to you a little bit about the connections and the community pieces. I want to give you a little bit of information about pathways into higher education and more specifically about there and here. And some of this can seem very boring, but it's really, really important. And the way that I talk about it, I think what, what Laura was saying was that this presentation will be shared with everyone afterwards. And I'm happy to take questions on particular pieces um, of it. I want to talk to you then about access offices and where student support is actually available. And I think it's really interesting because Megan will be talking about her own personal perspective, but I also have a very strong perspective about the reality of what actually happens to individual uh, students who progress to higher education, who don't often have good platforms or infrastructures of support and how they can be left very vulnerable in an individual way, trying to fight for really the very basics just to access education. Within it, I'm going to talk continuously about path. There's now five paths, one, two, three, four, and five, which probably makes it a highway. Maybe we could change it to that. But I'm going to embed it in so that you get a, a stronger understanding of where PATH actually sits. So just in relation to the culture and welcome piece, I suppose myself and Stacia have worked in higher education for a long time. And Stacia would have been, I suppose, looking at the, the contribution um, of uh, traveller society and culture to higher education even before I was. But what I have seen really significantly in the last, particularly the last five or six years, is a very strong sense that higher education offers a welcoming environment. And you can see that in the positionality of the National Access Plan. In some way, higher education doesn't have a choice about it. We've actually been set very specific actions. It has to become a more welcoming place, but it actually is. And I think for ourselves, there's a real focus on the acknowledgement and the value of traveler and Roma culture and the positive contributions that our students and graduates actually make. But you'll see all of the evidence of at a really high level there, um, our own president, acknowledging the visit of um, Michael McDonough to the university and how important that was in changing a narrative around the value and the uniqueness and the precious nature of a whole community's culture and language and traditions and how that brought it really to a central place within our own university. But this is also an issue across the entire um, higher education sector. The kinds of things that I just wanted to flag for you. So, for example, in Dundalk Institute of Technology, you'll see on the 11th of October, and I know, Laura, you're going to be talking about some of the, the kind of dates that you want to flag, but that similar celebration of travel and Roma culture, which we would have had frequently um, in Maynooth, the last being, I think, last Saturday week, um, is happening in, in Dundalk on the 11th of October. And that brings together the Traveller Living History Exhibition, but it also brings musicians on campus, uh, workshops on campus. And it's really important that you bring this wonderful celebration of history. Um, other things that I think are really important was the development of the Whidden Workshops, um, which is a collaboration with the um, uh, Munster Technological University and also a whole range of higher education institutions. And what we've also seen across the sector, which is really important, is the recruitment of a specific single person in institutions to actually coordinate both the recruitment of travellers in Roma, but also to support their transition and their post-entry support. And so within Maynooth, you'll see Megan has been appointed as our traveller um, outreach um, officer. And she has a kind of a unique role because she shares that role with uh, Pabby Point. But also uh, there's Breda and Leanne in Munster. Uh, there's David Freel in Sligo. There's Gillian um, in UCC and the Technological University, the Sharon are currently recruiting. So what I'm actually seeing is this change because you, it's really important that you have these people in these really influential points of um, contact. Uh, and what we have seen historically is that communities have very significant trust issues. And it's really important that there is an individual that they trust to help them to navigate those very complex points of where they are and where they want to go. And certainly uh, Megan has been very important for us in that regard. 
Another important way in relation to reaching out to the community is the PATH 3 programmes. So PATH is the programme for higher for access to uh, third level uh, higher education, and it is funded by the Higher Education Authority. It's really, really significant funding. And I suppose I'm speaking particularly to the Travel and Roma organisations that are here. It's so important that you link in with these programmes. For ourselves in Maynooth, it's a collaboration between ourselves, Dublin City University, Athlone Institute of Technology and Dundalk Institute of uh, Technology. But it has a very, very specific role. In our case, it is to link um, to community groups, including travellers, what it has seen is the establishment of community connectors. In other words, another single person in each of those four institutions working together to progress shared or common objectives and agendas. And it's really important. Um, I'll be speaking about College Connect frequently uh, through the course of this presentation, but it's really important for you to know that these programmes exist not just in, in our cluster, but also across the country and, and the importance of connecting to them. So just in relation to entry routes, one of the most important um, issues, and uh, Stacia actually referred to it, was the, the pathways into higher education. And I'm going to speak to you in a minute about here and there. But before that, I want to talk about the multiplicity of pathways that are available. So there's always a sense in some ways that only, the only people that go to college are 19 and 20 year olds who have just done their leave insert and they're the most important cohort and certainly they get all the headlines in the newspapers and we talk about them all the time but actually higher education is about so much more than just the 19 and 20 year olds. There's a whole range of um, programs and I see Kira Bradley is here who have been very important in the development of a return to learning program that Maynooth University ran in collaboration with the health service executive specifically for travellers. And it's really important that you know that there's a whole variety of foundation programs and return to learning programs that exist across the sector and they can be really important bridges between where you are and where you want to go, particularly if higher education is actually the dream. Stacia spoke about mature students. Again, there's different ways of considering um, application criteria. And for mature students, what you're looking for is that whole range of life skills. And I can't tell you how many women that I meet in particular who will tell you, I have no skills, uh, you know, that would translate into higher education. And then they tell me they're managing a home, they're managing a budget, they're managing children, they're putting people through school, they're working in community projects. And it seems to me that they have all the skills necessary to, to translate and to be successful students in higher education. Further education and training is also really important. And maybe one of the things that Station didn't mention around the, the national context is that there is a huge focus now on creating bridges between further education and training and higher education. And it's very important for you to know that across the sector, what we're looking to do effectively is to allow people to plan their pathway where maybe they're starting in a particular place. They might move on to further education training. They might go to a foundation program and then they might potentially move into higher education from there. I wanted to flag for you path one. And the importance of path one is that it was one of the first funds that was developed and it was specifically about broadening access to initial teacher education. I cannot tell you how important it is that we have travellers and Roma who are teachers and educators because having them in those powerful positions speaks to a whole community who often don't see themselves reflected in the teacher population at all. And so Turn to Teaching is the programme that uh, we developed as part of PATH1. It is the largest of the programmes under uh, PATH1, but we set up a foundation programme specifically for entry into initial teacher education. And a significant number of travellers, many of whom had left school early, have been able to access that programme and are now engaged in teacher training programmes successfully. And really what I want to flag for you is the importance of these programmes and the importance of connecting to them and broadcasting and making um, prospective students aware of them. Here and there can seem very complicated, but really they are just two sister pathways for people who are doing the Leaving Cert. And I'm going to give you kind of the, the bottom route around them. Here is specifically about socioeconomic disadvantage and DARE is specifically about disability. But if you cut through all of the fluff about what both of them actually are, what they actually do is they offer places on reduced points. And that's really important to know that. And it is an acknowledgement 
And, and when Megan starts to talk about, I suppose, her own history through the primary and second level system, it offers an acknowledgement that it is not reasonable to expect those students to compete or to achieve to the same level as other students. It's not a reflection of their academic ability. It's a reflection of the barriers and the systemic discrimination, in fact, that many students experience in the education system. What's really important to know about both of them is they're, they're quite bureaucratic in some respects because you really have to fit into the box. There's an application process, you have to provide the right documentation, and it can be really off-putting. But what it is important about it is what happens at the end of it. You can get a place in a college right across the country on reduced points. So if I give you an example, let's say that you had a student and they wanted to do law and law in Maynooth was 450 points and they were eligible for here, then, and if they were at 400 points in their leaving cert, they would get that offer on that law course exactly the same as the other student who had 450 points. If you're eligible for both schemes, and many travelers are, they are prioritized above all others. And so what we're trying to do in those schemes is to not to think that every student is the same, but to look at, at different levels of um, disadvantage. What it also offers you is access to orientation programs, recognizing how difficult those transitions can be, access to individual student advisors, recognizing that retention and participation can be very challenging for travelers when they don't see anybody like them, uh, perhaps in that higher education institution. It offers extra tuition and study skills, ways to connect socially, additional financial assistance, and for people with disabilities, things like examination support and assistive technology. So they're really incredibly important. And I spoke to you earlier about College Connect, and maybe only Megan knows this, but when I was writing the proposal for College Connect, which is part three, there was one student that I wrote the proposal around. And at all times when I was writing that proposal, I kept thinking about that student's experience. And that student was a traveler. It was somebody who should have been eligible for here. It was somebody who needed to progress to college, but they didn't get the appropriate supports at the appropriate time. And that student was Megan. And that whole proposal was written with me constantly thinking back to why things were only able to happen for individual students if they had individual support. And really what myself and Anastasia, I think, have been working for over many years, and many of you here in various organizations, is that you shouldn't have to rely on individual support. And so it's really important that we connect to these kinds of uh, programs. The really important changes that are taking place for students that are applying to HERE in 2024 is that the HERE process is based on a series of indicators. Two of the most important indicators, for example, are that you went to a DESH school or that you live in an area of disadvantage. What will happen from 2024 is that the HERE process will take traveler ethnicity into account. That's really important. Like uh, care of the state applicants, you won't have to supply supporting financial documentation really important and also that travelers will be treated as priority for offers in the same way as a number of students are prioritized through the DARE scheme. So these are really critical changes and as Anastasia says nothing happens by accident. This has happened because of a lot of the work that many people in the room have been doing over the last number of years in order to make this happen and I think this is a great acknowledgement of that work. Just around more information on here and there, there will be, though there's here um, information sessions and dare information sessions that will happen early in January. Um, you will make the application by the 1st of February, like everybody has to make an application to the CEO by the 1st of February. You have until the 1st of March to complete your application and the 15th of March to provide the documentation. The important thing to remember is that these dates are not variable, they're absolutely rock hard. So it's really important as organizations that if you know of students that potentially will be in the frame for this offer, that you prioritize their applications for the scheme, make sure that you put them in the pot. If they're not in the pot, they can't come in afterwards and then get support from HEIs to, to make their applications. I wanted to flag for you the importance of access offices and student supports because there's so much support available. And I've just pulled kind of a screen grab from, from UCC, 
So there's various supports available, whether it's around targeted disability support, there's student advisors, there's technology. We meet with students regularly, and Megan will talk to you a little bit about that. There's mentoring programs in UCC, for example, specifically for um, travelers. There's so much support there. The difficulty, and Megan might speak a little bit about this, is that there's really issues of trust for individuals. Um, as they're making that transition to HE, they don't know who to reach out to. They don't know who they can trust with information. And often what happens is that by the time they come looking for support, um, it can be so far into the term that it's actually difficult to, to help them. And the key message that I want to get out to you is that we want to hear from you. We want to know about you. We want you to come and talk to us, even if you're only coming to say everything is wonderful. But we hear all the time from students who are having difficulties with accommodation, students who are having difficulties as they move through their program when they're progressing to PME. And just to give you an example of the kind of, of issues, for example, we would have had um, one of the first travelers to go into the PME program to train to be a secondary school teacher. And as he said, he realized when he went on teacher placement, he didn't have teacher clothes. Teacher clothes are different to student clothes. And that's something that, you know, you, you mightn't have anticipated, but it's really important that they link in with that point of contact in the HE to make sure that we can do that and arrange that and organize that and, and address those kinds of uh, barriers. And that's really, really important. The other supports that are out there that are really important and that no matter how much we try to get that information out there, students tend not to, 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 to know it. First of all, there's a laptop loan scheme in every institution in the country. And that laptop loan scheme isn't for two months, it's for the entire duration of the student's study. So in reality, almost every traveler that starts with us this year in Manuk that needs a laptop will get one. But what we find is that students and their families stress before they come into college, take out loans that they can't afford, get laptops that they don't need, when in fact, the system is there for them. And in Maynooth, another thing they could do is even if they leave their laptop at home, we have banks, lap safes, they're called, where you can just take out the laptop for the day and pop it back in at the end of the day. So it's really important to know that technology can be a real barrier, but there's supports there. Through the Fund for Students with Disabilities, there's actually specific support um, for people with disabilities and the station mentioned and it's really important to flag for you mental health is a huge issue in the traveler community a huge issue and for us it's really important that we recognize the intersectionality of experiences that students have so when students are with us we have really world-class mental health supports and our job is to link those students to that so they may need what we find with students is that those students, they might need financial support, they might need access to a student advisor, they might need some additional tuition, they might need accommodation on campus or support with, um, with um, accommodation, they might need mental health support. And it's a matter for us of coordinating that support so that those students get whatever it is that they need in the way that they need it when they need it. The other thing that's really important to know is the Student Assistance Fund is a very significant fund at the national level. It is available to every single higher education institution in the country, and it is dispersed to students who need it. Just so that you don't think, one of the big misapprehensions, first of all, is if you're in receipt of a grant, you can't get Susie. You absolutely can. You absolutely can. And to give you a sense of how much money is involved, uh, last year, Maynooth would have distributed 1.2 million to over 1,000 students through the Student Assistance Fund. And it's really important because many of the travelers that we meet that are progressing through Maynooth, they need, for example, five or 600 euros to put down the deposit on accommodation, or they might need teacher's clothes, or they might need to get additional tuition, or it might be transport costs. And it's really important to know that this fund is there to help people and to make sure our job is to make sure that they stay in college and complete their degree. And that's what the fund is there for. It's not charity. It's not something that they need to beg for or make a, a big issue about. It's something that really we want people that have needed to apply for because we want them to have it. We want them to stay in college. The other thing that's really important and Station mentioned it is Path 2. Path 2 is the 1916 bursaries. And these, these were introduced because we know uh, that the SUSE grant scheme is not sufficient to meet the cost of higher education. The gap varies between probably between the reality, if you think about it, on average, uh, going to college will cost you previously, before the huge uh, increases, 
probably somewhere between around 14 or 15,000 a year. If the top up rate of grant is only six and a half thousand, you can see the gap. So what the HEA have tried to do is to develop these 1916 bursaries. It's targeted at those at the lowest amount of income where their income would have been less than 24 and a half thousand. And effectively that's also the limit for the top up SUSE grant. What's really critical about the bursaries is that students who qualify for those bursaries, they get 5,000 euros per year for each year of their undergraduate degree, and that carries forward into postgrad study. And so you can see how important this would be for a traveler who potentially is on the SUSE top up grant. But what they don't have to do now is scrabble around for additional pockets of money. They don't have to go to the Vincent de Paul. They don't have to go to the Student Assistance Fund. And most importantly, they don't have to end up working 20 or 30 hours a week to stay in college. Effectively, it creates what I call all the time the optimum conditions for academic success. And having a reasonable amount of financial support is, is really important for that. There's tiers of bursaries. Even if you don't get the 5,000, you can get 2,000. Even if you don't get the 2,000, you can get a once-off bursary of 1,500. And so again, there's an application process. It's a little bit bureaucratic, and, but it's really important that you're aware of the fact that those bursaries are there. The first year that we opened the bursary scheme in Maynooth University, we got 300 applications for the bursary and not one traveler applied. And currently in every single bursary application process that we've had, about a third of the successful applicants have been travelers. And so it's really important for you to know uh, that this support is actually there. What's also important to know is that it's available across the whole country. Every single higher education institution has access to these bursaries, but there are closing dates, there's schemes that you have to apply for. So just to remember, and that's why the organizations are so important in helping people to make these um, applications. Path four has just been announced and path four is about universal design for learning. And you're probably thinking, well, why is that important for me? But the reason that it's important is because our higher education institutions need to be places where diversity is embedded in every aspect of your thinking, your practice, the curriculum, how we assess, uh, flexible modes of teaching and learning. And this is actually going to be a massive part of our work in the next five or six years. And I'm flagging this specifically for Traveller and Roma organizations. Uh, I am currently developing a proposal for Maynooth University. The proposals across the country have to be submitted by tomorrow week, but the amount of funding here is in the millions. And it's really important that the Traveller and Roma perspective is built in to the, um, the proposals and the implementation of these kinds of action plans that are going to happen um, across um, higher education. Path five is particularly um, important. Path five started, and Stacia would have been involved in lots of these things. She's a great woman for shaking money out of different places. And it started as a result of money coming from the dormant account fund. But what was really important about that 300,000 wasn't the amount of money, which isn't significant in, in the bigger picture. What was significant was what it asked higher education institutions to do. So they said, we'll give you some money, but we'll only give it to you if you develop a plan for how you're going to recruit and support travelers and Roma in your own individual institutions. And that was incredibly important because it made higher education institutions set out, well, what's our proposal? In our institution, in Maynooth University, our proposal was almost entirely around the appointment of Megan as an outreach worker for our institution. We wanted a, a person who would work specifically with travel and Roma communities and the Whitten workshops, that was ours. Other institutions have put it into, for example, targeted bursaries or employment programs or mentoring programs. So that, that funding was applied in different ways in different institutions. What's important about it is that it has increased to 450,000. Myself and Stacia also take the same approaches to these things. We always think 450,000 is a drop in the ocean. When is it going to be four and a half million? But what's also important is that rather than it being on a year by year basis, it's now going to be a three year plan. And that's really important because it gives certainty to what HEIs are going to do. Again, in our case, 
I think my intention is that that traveler outreach role, which currently is a half time role, would become a full time role. And again, what you can see is that what higher education institutions will have done, they have an opportunity to en enhance it and, and to embed it. But the intention is we, we, we don't didn't need to start our work from the very beginning. We've been working in the area of traveler support for 30 or 40 years, but it allows you to kind of put a real focus and a, and a strategic um, framework um, on it. And just the kind of last, I suppose, maybe when, when I look over my, my career and working particularly with, with traveler groups, there was some advice, I suppose, that I wanted to, to give. Um, and this is both for advocacy organizations and for uh, students. A really important thing to do is to link with access offices. All of them have outreach staff. And you may be surprised by this, but often really important work begins by an organization contacting their local HEI to say, actually, would you like to work with us? Or we have a really good idea, or we have a program that we would like to bring to you. And I think it's really important to link uh, with those. It's particularly important around guidance on pathways. Many travelers have been out of education for a significant period of time, or they may be in a school where the guidance provision isn't particularly good. And again, low expectations are endemic across the education system. So students who are clearly ready and able to go on to higher education may be getting really poor advice in schools, for example, not to do higher level Irish, not to do higher level maths, not to necessarily apply for an FET college, you wouldn't necessarily go to HE. But we have the capacity to give really good advice on strong pathways to find your way into HE. Go to those here and there advice clinics because it gives you a great opportunity to consider your own application. Go to the Whidden workshops. And if you have Travellers and Roma uh, linking with your organization, link them in with the various institutions who are running these workshops because it allows travelers to connect together and to advise and support each other. Link with access offices, particularly because we have dedicated student advisors who are meeting these students, but you don't hand over for many of the organizations that are working with students you might have been working with them for 10 or 15 years and that relationship doesn't easily translate into a new institution. It's a kind of a relationship of trust that will continue on probably through the entire lifetime of when they're in that higher education institution. So working together with organizations is really important. Apply, apply, apply. If you don't apply for the bursary scheme, well, you can know for sure that you're not going to be eligible. So apply for it, but get advice also about how to make sure that you make the right application apply for the student assistance fund and apply for the laptop loan schemes. And finally, I would say just to connect to those PATH programs, particularly those advocacy organizations, because strengthening your own connections with either your local or regional HEIs, I think is a critical part, not just of building in your own voice into the development of um, strategy and policy, but we, it's really important. I can't tell you the number of times that Stacia would send me a message in saying, this student is in Maynooth and he needs A, B, C and D, make it happen. And I always say, yes, Stacia, I'll do that and make it happen. But those connections are so incredibly um, important. And I think that's my advice for today, uh, Megan, but I'm happy to talk to anybody if they have any questions later on. That's brilliant. Thanks very much, Rose. Um, you highlighted some very important points that I'm going to talk to now in just a second. Um, but I suppose for myself, um, I've spent an awful long time across the education system and I've had a good experience of various different schools. I attended four primary schools, um, a secondary school, two secondary schools, college and a university. I know we're here today to specifically talk about the experiences of higher education, but we can't talk about access to higher education without looking at the issues from early years onwards. You know, I think um, I came from a family of 13. So for me, I think the main issue is, was that financial barrier the cost, little things you wouldn't know of, like, you know, school buses, like um, trying to get 13 lunches along with 13 dinners a day, you know, uh, for the week was very, very hard. Um, trying to afford materials and books and things. And I suppose from my own experience in school, a lot of the teachers don't understand or see um, the issues of poverty, to see it, them kind of issues as neglect you know, and that gives a fear of parents then sending the children to school, gives a, a fear for myself of um, going to school. I suppose another issue then going up um, 
Rose had mentioned it earlier when I was trying to apply for grants um, I couldn't get a grant you had to, the thing about Susie is that you have to swear affidavits if you're you know independent from your parents or from your um, family or you have to get a letter of estrangement it's, it's very hard to get documentation um, when you don't have access to maybe internet when you don't have access to that kind of one-to-one -one direct supports and I suppose I was the first in my family to progress on third level education. So we had nobody to actually say, well, this is how it's done. This is where you can go from here. I suppose when I had applied, so you meet you meet barriers the whole way and you're constantly begging as an individual to first support and it's knocking on doors constantly. Can I have this? Can I have that? And can I have the other? And I suppose when I had applied then for, when I had done my leaving, sorry, I had left school after fourth year, but I returned in fifth year. And um, when I had done my leave insert, we had costs of like, you know, um, I suppose the mock exams, they're 200 euros. So where are we going to get that? Whose door do we knock on for that? And then it was applied. That, so that was one barrier, was one worry. We got that. The school was very supportive. And then I suppose progressing on and looking at college opportunities and um that kind of lack of information of where we can go to apply for these hair schemes stair schemes and you know just by the skin of my teeth I was very lucky to get the my bachelor of arts in Carlow College in the end when I couldn't uh, when the opportunity in the new didn't present itself so I suppose you know it was one thing after the other it was and then as you go along on the journey and Rose had mentioned it as well that low expectations that kind of taught you you internalize that because you're told your community have an intergenerational fear I suppose and I can't speak for everybody but I'll speak for my own family of the education system because of the negative experiences that they may have had so the value and support is not so much there they think well look you're going to spend so long in the education system you're not going to get a job there's very high levels of discrimination and racism in the workforce and um so that's you're internalizing that and that's a huge fear but then you're also internalizing the perspective from the institutions that like you know you're not you're better off to doing the lcvp or your your lca or you're better off to doing the hairdressing course you know you're not going to progress so i suppose at one stage of my life i actually went mute i couldn't talk <laughs> because of that's the impact of them low expectations um i suppose another issue then is looking at you know for me progressing onto college was huge um, being able to avail of that laptop uh, loan scheme was very important because coming on my own to school at, at college was very isolating and um, trying to get them supports elsewhere was very hard and again when you're so used to knocking on doors you'll actually come to a stage in the end when you're being told no so many times that you won't ask for the help so a fiver could get you through two weeks and nobody would ever know and I know if it wasn't for the support of the access offices and being able to go back to them and say well actually this is how I'm living at the minute and to see you know that the support's been rolled out that that was very beneficial I suppose for me as well and um, because Susie was so delayed I didn't get it I think until the end of the first year and um, I was very very lucky and I'll always say this to be able to get the sponsorship from the Sisters of Mercy that I did receive to be able to help me with books transport living uh, situations and these are things you know Rose had mentioned earlier the cost now of the, the influx of the cost of living circumstances and the cost that it does um it does to go to college or to progress in education but if you're looking at travelers that's only one side of things but there's layers and layers of other issues that are there as well and constant barriers that are coming up in the way if you have like you could be living in oh for me my personal experience I was living in overcrowded living circumstances it was hard to get a space to study or learn when I was in college and um, it was hard when I went I went to get um accommodation um around the area where I had, was studying I face very high levels of discrimination and from my work with some of the students when I've been trying to support them over the last while to try and secure accommodation as well that's an issue you know the minute they see the second name on the application or something it's a no they'll be invited to see the the accommodation and then the minute they see the accommodation it's a no um when the house owners know who they are so I suppose these are all kind of you know layers and overarching issues that are there and I think the grant system is hugely and it has a profound effect on students who can't actually avail of it because it really puts them into a very vulnerable situation where they they just don't know where to go. So I think the importance of the access office having that advisor and being able to go in um, and be able to talk about your experience and get that bit of support is so, so important. I can't, you know, talk about it enough. And I would also say that it's um it's going, being able to go in and, 
see identify with somebody that you know that is a traveler so for me what would have been very helpful when I was in my undergrad was knowing about the National Traveler Graduate Network it wasn't until I actually done my placement in Pabby Point that I felt that kind of network of support and identity from my own community because going into a college or a space can be very much isolating when you don't have anybody to relate with or connect with and as Rose said um, you might have that kind of fear of trust and being able to kind of ask for that bit of support or help. Other issues that I see and throughout my own work would be the fear of unemployment, not being able to get a job afterwards, maybe some cultural aspects that intergenerational, you know, some people say to me, but Megan, um, travellers want to get married, they don't want an education. But if we're looking at it this way, and this again from my own family, we're not a homogenous group, we we see my family, we would see marriage as security, just as much as settled people would see their children going to college, getting employment as security. That opportunity is not so much there for travellers and wasn't there for members of my family. You know, so having that family, getting married and settling down, that was the security. That was when you know they're safe and happy because um, the, the alternative opportunity was not there. Um, so I suppose the issues that we're anticipating uh, coming up for Traveller and Roma would be the cost of living crisis. Uh, the impacts of COVID-19, we don't know where, you know, that's going to impact students at a primary level and um, looking at their own, you know, I know throughout the station meant to consultation, mentioned the consultation process at the beginning that happened throughout COVID-19. And I know a lot of parents did say that they felt like their children didn't get any, traveller parents felt like their children didn't get any class of education throughout COVID-19 at all because of the digital divide, because of being, you know, pushed to the margins, because of not, we don't care what users are doing because users are travellers and users are not going to progress anyway so we'll just look at the ones who are the most important to us and um, the issues then of obviously it's always going to be an issue the issues of overcrowding poverty living circumstances if you have parents out there that are living on sites that have no um you know no sanitation no water no basic uh, utilities I mean, to put food on the table, if you're looking at Maslow and the hierarchy of needs, the physical needs of a child needs to be met first before they can think about ever progressing. And I always say that because sometimes people say to me, oh, such a child is coming in late 10 minutes or 15 minutes. And I'm saying, well, if they are, give them a pat on the back and be happy that they're even there. You know, from where they're coming from, it's a huge step to even be there, better late than ever. Um, so I suppose the kind of what, what we would be looking at and, you know, the further supports and actions that we do need, Stacia had mentioned earlier, the disaggregated data is so important. We need to know what kind of experiences travellers are having across the whole education from early years the whole way up so that we can reach out for better outcomes. Um, and also, you know, I know I'm talking a lot about travellers here because I am a traveller, but we're not to forget about the Roma community as well. And Roma have significant issues and the very similar issues than what I have and they're significantly underrepresented in um, the higher education and across the education system. But actually a student, I was working with a Roma student a few weeks ago and she said to me, if it wasn't for the access office, she would never have been able to um, identify as a trap as a Roma student herself she felt like you know going in there and being able to talk to a specific advisor gave her that confidence to be able to say well I am a Roma and then to start being you know open about who she was and to be able to have pride in that as well which I think is extremely important um but I suppose in terms of the supports and actions needed we do need to segregate data we need to look at in order to address the issues at higher level education we need to look at the issues of stages said earlier at early years primary education the primary education is the fundamental aspect of education because it's the development of your capacity uh -huh. your cognitive development as well you know how you start to think and it really flourishes you if you have them expectations if you know um positive experiences is embedded from the beginning we're in we're you know we will get better outcomes in the end um, I think the education strategy um, in the programme for government really needs to be implemented um, and developed with clear targets, indicators and um, also, you know, monitoring processes and in consult consultation as well with the traveller organisations. Um, I suppose it's very positive to see the development of supports that are rolled out in various HEIs like the traveller outreach officers. But again, that needs to be reflected across the whole of the education system for both travellers and Roma students. Again, as Stacia said earlier, you know, we have these kind of outreach positions for travellers. We have all of these targeted supports in, in for travellers, but we need to really reach the same targets for the Roma community now. Um, and again, the targets in the National Access Plan, they need to have clear targets, they need to be monitored and, you know, they need to have uh, clear indicators as well and need to be done in consultation with the traveller organisations. Um, if traveller and Roma children feel the sense of belonging from day one, that will pave their way. But if they feel the sense of low expectations, that will knock them off the road. Um, so I suppose 
that's all from me. Um, and I hope you have learned a little bit from the three speakers. Thank you very much, Megan. Now we've talked a lot. You've you, you've had an hour of listening to all of us. So at, at this stage, the idea is that rather than continuing in plenary, we break up into smaller groups just for a very short period of time so that people have a chance to say, to give their comments uh, and, and to raise any suggestions.